My title for my presentation is Learners Orchestrating Their Own Learning. And why have I choose the, that title? Because I argue that we have to change perspectives in learning and education. In the global learning arena, we need to take the learner's point of view, and that aligns with the themes I have for my presentation. Sorry. Uh, so I am Ebba Nilsson from Lund University in Sweden. I recently, in the summer 2012, uh, earned my PhD from Ola University in Finland, and I did it to distance. Uh, I used to work for several international and uh, national organizations on open learning and quality, and some of them are representative here by the Lagos. I will especially emphasize the work on the Paris Declaration by UNESCO and the work with OER services where I used to work. I also used to work as a reviewer for several organizations for quality in e-learning and distance learning. And just to mention some, it's SQL and um, eProbate. I have uh, been asked to talk about this topic, which I will share with you this morning. So I'm very happy to do that, and I really appreciate this uh, Open Education Week. I uh, participated last year, and it was a great event. So I'm happy to be here. I strongly believe, believe in caring is sharing, and sharing is caring. So here are my footprints and my contact details. And this presentation is also downloaded at SlideShare. And I know that this presentation will be recorded as well, together with the slides. So why am I, am I interested in open education and quality? I work at Lund University in Sweden. A university used to be referred to as a world-class university with strong focus on innovation. There are many leading companies which was founded in Lund with strong cooperation with the university. And I'm sure you recognize some of them, for example, Tetra Pak, Alpha Laval, Gambro, Ericsson, or now Sony, and also the most recently, Max4 and ESS for nanotechnology. Lund University dates back to 1666 and has grown to be the largest one in Scandinavia with some 47,000 students and almost 3,000 research students and around 7,000 employees. So innovation and open learning are very high on the agenda here at Lund University. And with my international background as well, I see that open education and innovation are some of the strongest driving forces for education nowadays. I have uh, four focus themes in my presentation, and that is about personalization, time, quality, innovation, in a global, Nordic, and local perspective. The first theme is about personalization. And I will argue that it's so important to take the individual's perspective on learning and education. And that is also some of the main results from the research which I have uh, conducted. And I will talk more about that later on. But <clears throat> learning and education, we always have to take the learner's perspective, because it is the learner who choose to do some learning or some education or enroll in some programs. So we need to, to ask, what's in it for, for the learners? And the learners need to ask, what's in it for me? What about quality? We know that the quality are not very easy to define, but each individual has their own perspective on quality, and that is what they are looking for. They are also looking for open education because uh, <coughs> it is part of their reputation. They would like to gain the, the best education from all over the world, and that is possible now with open education. 
So they would like to have a good reputation in their educational life. And it's also very much about competition. Who are you? And what have you done? And what do you like to do? And what can you contribute with? Open education is very much about internationalization. internationalization. And for young students today, and even for lifelong learners, internationalization is so important. And open education can lead to all those things for the individual learners. The second theme is about time. How do, you use, how do we use the time? It is very often argued that uh, students have too little time with the teachers or with their academics. And that is true. And that is a very, very big problem. And maybe it doesn't have to be a problem because it's more a way of how we use the time when the teacher and the students are together. Of course, it's too little time together when if you have uh, lectures and we have, when you have maybe 400 students in a lecture hall and you just have a talk or a speech. With open education and with open education resources and with um, MOOCs, for example, which is uh, very upcoming for the moment, you can use the time in a better way together with your students. The, the academics and the teachers can be mentors, coaching, and you can have very, very deep uh, academic talks in seminars, workshops. If the students are prepared with resources from all over the world and from the best universities, they can gain a lot. And then you can, when the students are prepared, you can have really, really interesting and deep discussions and to, to gain the reputation and to, and to come far, far away for, for your academic talks. The thing is that uh, we have a move from content to context. The content is available all over from internet and from all over the universities, and especially, especially with the free resources. As I mentioned, with open education resources, everything is available from all of the best uh, professors and from all of the best universities in the world. So what the teachers and the academics have to, so to, to do is to, get to um, create context where you can use all those resources and the content and to discuss so you can go deeper in your learning processes. So it is very much about quality time, not the time as such, the working hours we have. We all know that we have 24 hours day and night, but it is what we're doing with the time. And again, if you take the learner's perspective, I think, what's in it for me? Then you can use the time you have, even if it is limit, li limited, you can use the time you have together with your students. The third theme is about quality. We have a move from from, my stu from our students, our support, our content from each, uh, each university in the world. And that is two words. We have nearly 9 billion learners out in the world together. And if you should uh, serve all those learners, with higher education, you should build maybe one, uh, seven universities a week. And that is not feasible. We have more to think about the universities. Maybe we'll do, have another role, and maybe we'll have um, use a local assessment and the crediting. And we have to think that we universities, and we should work together with any learners, any teacher, and any content 
And that is why open education resources play on such an important role. Because we have to do this together. As I mentioned, I have recently done my PhD. And that is about benchmarking e-learning, or I will say maybe more away the, the E. Benchmarking e-learning in higher education. And what I, what I did in the research was to uh, look for indicators for quality in e-learning, and also the benefits of benchmarking, and to look at quality issues and how, how benchmarking could be a tool and be a part of ordinary quality assurance work. And the most important in my dissertation is that there come up some new themes. And those are some of the themes I present here. Personalization, time, quality, and innovation. And I would really like to stress that we have to rethink very much in education and learning. But we also have to rethink very much about quality and quality assurance and quality enhancement and quality improvement. And some of the indicators which came, came up very explicit are in the following slides. Some quality dimensions which we have to to care about and to reflect on, especially when we take learners' perspectives, is that accessibility is very, very important. And especially if you're working with, with distance education, when you have to, when the learner has to do everything him or herself to to the computer and to internet, and not have uh, direct contact, I mean, uh, physical direct contact with their academics. The assessments is very, very important. Also, creativity. Learning design, especially on online teaching, you have to design your learning acti activities and your learning modules in a different way so the learner can take control of their own learning. And that means also that um, flexibility is crucial because we have uh, students all from all over the world. We have different time zones to cope with. We have uh, different um, responsibilities in our daily life. Some like to study in the morning, some in the evenings, uh, some in the during the night. And together with those different time zones, it has to be flexible. flexible. And also that the, the, the workload for the learner need to be divided so they can take control. Some may be like to do all the assignments, for example, for weekends or for the evenings. Uh, some would like to have it more modularized uh, for each week or uh, each day. Interactivity. It's very, very crucial so that it, the learners can be seen to, so they can take part, so they can uh, have some kind of feedback with the learning environment. And then we come to involvement. That is also about to be seen, to take control, to orchestra what you can do with your own learning, to see that you are a part of the learning process and together with the, with the other in the course and with the, with the learning material. Ownership, that comes again with involvement and personalization. If you feel ownership, then you can, can take control and then you can be responsible. 
It also comes up the uh, presence, the teachers and the other course mates' uh, presence when you're talking about online learning. And then transparency is another dimension. If you have trans transparency in your online learning course, then again, the students can take control because then they can see what kind of demands there are, what kind of tasks there are, how they can be involved, how they can take control, how they can really make the inter interactivity. So in the, my research, I came up to that there is a need to change a paradigm, education paradigm, and to look at things more in a, in a word so more a serendipity perspective. And some uh, dimensions which very often come up for online learning and teaching is openness, uh, content and context, which we already have talked about. Uh, there are some general issues such as motivation, uh, internal uh, uh, control, internal motivation, uh, technology, of course, pedagogy and didactic, but also leadership and vision from management level. It's very, very important how online learn learning is conducted. And then there are some of the dim dimensions which I described with the, with the previous slide such as interactivity, flexibility, accessibility, transparency, involvement, and personalization. And when you see it from a red zone perspective, there are always new things coming up because life is changing, time is changing, context is changing. So you need also to be flexible to take in some new dimensions which you don't really are aware of maybe right now. <clears throat> when you talk about quality, it is not very easy in one way because it is rather complex because you first have the context. You have the cultural context, you have the historical context in it for education. Uh, you have, uh, of course, the, the content, which have to be sometimes in the context. And then you also have different size stakeholders. Here are just some examples how, how it can look. I mean, first we have all the whole world with all the different cultures and uh, people living in different countries with different kind of background and history, a different kind of demands. We also have a different kind of technical advices. We also have different kind of design in the in learning activities. And then to the to the right we have the whole area of the new social media, which we don't really know so much about yet, about quality aspects. But that is also one reason why it's important to have this white home perspective, because there are new things coming up which we don't really know so much about. And also talking about quality, it depends which kind of perspective we have. If we have a retrospective or prospective perspective, most often quality assurance or from a retrospective perspective. We are looking, what have we done? And maybe sometimes uh, years, years ago, because uh, quality assurance processes used to be rather long and rather complicated. And you can, of course, ask, is that of interest, what we did uh, two years ago or one year ago? Yes, in one way it can be. But maybe it's more interesting to have a prospective perspective. So you can learn from where you are now and go ahead. So as I said, uh, quite often we are looking at uh, certification, accreditation, quality assurance, and that is mainly from a retrospective 
way. Uh, I think the trend in quality in learning is more about we're going from control to quality enhancement, about self-evaluation, about peer review, and about benchmarking. And then, of course, it is very often like that, that how you are asking, this, that very much uh, predict the kind of answers you get. So you always have to ask yourself, why should you measure quality? What shall you measure? When, how, and where? So quite simple questions. But depending how you ask those questions, um, very much depends on what kind of answers you get. But the trend for quality is very, very much about self-evaluation. And that, that I also found in the research that benchmarking is a form of self-evaluation. Of self and when you are doing self-evaluation, then you are more uh, keen to maybe make changes because you can see yourself that something has to be changed or something has to be done, or even something is good enough. And that is also very important. And quality is very much about which kind of quality culture you have, or would like to have. I will argue for, for a dialectic approach. Maybe we need to sometimes have quality control, process models, guidelines, rules, standards, etc. But we also need to have the bottom-up perspective about competences, attitudes, values, self-evaluation. And of course, it is very, very good if those two perspectives meet each other. Because it is very much about communication, trust, cooperation, inclusiveness, innovation, and creativity. Uh, international, there are some uh, um, organizations working with certification and accreditation. And just to, to mention some of them, uh, I also did that uh, from the beginning. SQL is one uh, with the, the, the unique uh, certification. eProbate is another one. Uh, E-Excellence uh, is again another one. And to my research, I went to most of the, the international uh, systems for, for quality assurance in, in online learning. And I would really um, encourage you to go through quality, quality assurance work, because you learn a lot about yourself, about your own education, about your own institution. And you learn a lot from others if you're doing it in cooperation. Now I will move to the fourth theme about innovation. And I will mention um, an international project to start with, and that is Power Up, or Power Up. And that is about policies for OER uptake. It's a, it is a rather new initiative. And what they see very much is that there are emerging themes, and there is a shift from development of OER practice, of OER to OER practices. There is a broader notion of open practice and open learning, teaching, and research. And also here, they focus on the social and participat participatory media to foster OER communities. And I think their work will uh, have a great influence uh, for all of us, because uh, they are working very much about with policies and policy uptakes and with government on a governmental issue, uh, level. I 
I will mention a new Nordic uh, initiative about open educational resources, and that is the Nordic Open Education Resource Alliance. The Nordic countries um, are in one way rather, maybe not unique, but it's a uni uh, very interesting initiative as we are working on a regional uh, level. Uh, all those countries are in one way quite similar. Uh, we can nearly understand each other with languages, especially the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Danish. Uh, we have um, a rather similar history and background, uh, nature and culture, but still, of course, th those countries are very uh, different in, in many ways. But we also have a strong belief on, uh, on education and democracy and about free education. We have had, uh, had that for a long time. Uh, the Paris Aware Declaration and the European Commission's opening up education and uh, now the recent uh, initiatives from European Universities Association about open education. They are rather strong in many countries around, but not very strong in the Nordic countries. Uh, for some or another reason, I don't really know. <laughs> but uh, what uh, the Nordic OER Alliance would like to, to work on is how, th uh, how those um, initiatives from higher levels can and will influence the Nordic countries. But also how the Nordic countries, because of the, due to what I, what I said about uh, culture and um, long tradition of education, of free education and uh, democracy. Um, we think we have something we, we can uh, contribute with. This initiative started uh, last year, you know, in autumn, late autumn last year, so it is rather new. But we have uh, already done something and we have uh, written a position paper about um, how we can first implement, uh, try to implement uh, those um, larger initiatives as the Paris OER Declaration and the EC opening up uh, education statement, but also how we can contribute and how to make it work, and especially how to create long-term trusted mutual partnerships. So it is very much about um, first to identify, identify possibilities, but also to identify barriers and how we can make actions, and especially how we can uh, make recommendations on policy, institutional, and at individual level. In the position paper, we have um, discussed quite a lot about, that, uh, as I mentioned, adult education has been uh, has a very strong uh, history in the Nordic countries, uh, as well as uh, democracy. The ICT and the digital agenda is also on a very high level, and there we also think we can contribute to the the statement which is in the Paris uh, OER Declaration. So we think uh, that Nordic countries uh, to this alliance can contribute in utilizing OER for educational development and to enable and support collaborative actions in the countries, which can have an influence in the rest of the world. We think we can contribute to global educational development. We think we can enable and support collaborative actions. We would like to offer a knowledge resource and an awareness network for advice and on OER and open education policies and to, to make that to policy implementation.
We would like to support the implementation of the Paris OR Declaration and future EU OR OR initiatives in the Nordic countries, but also to analyze opportunities and barriers and to provide guidance for policy makers and to build an ex and exchange knowledge on OER and OEP in the Nordic region as a base for good practice. Uh, I mentioned uh, in the slide uh, the PISA, uh, Sweden and Finland. Um, as maybe you know, the Finland used to be very high ranked uh, in the PISA studies. And there has been a lot of discussion about that uh, in the recent years. And one um, explanation, which they see themselves and other countries uh, see as, as well, is that um, education and uh, teachers are very high ranked uh, on the status level. Uh, and also that um, that the government very much support uh, education and teacher training and put high values of that. I mentioned Sweden as well and uh, although I am from Sweden myself, um, there are some worries in Sweden because we were used to be also high, very high ranked uh, in the PISA studies but uh, we, uh, in the latest years, unfortunately, the status has gone down. And I think maybe, uh, not I, but um, there are discussions that um, we have the contradictory um, expression that as Finland have, um, because to be a teacher is not very, very high rank. They have a very low salaries, and um, um, sometimes even um, you can can work as a teacher even if you don't have the formal uh, education. So, of course, that is very, very interesting uh, discussions and also uh, those countries can, can learn a lot from each other. Why, for example, why is Finland always ranked among the highest in the PISA studies? What can we learn from that? Uh, I would like to make uh, some credits to my, my colleagues uh, around in, in the Nordic countries. Uh, uh, we have been some who have initiati initiated uh, this uh, Nordic OER alliances. And my colleagues from Norway, from Finland, from Denmark, uh, from Sweden. Uh, but still we need uh, contacts from Iceland and Greenland and Oland, but uh, they are on, on its way. So if someone of you listen to this presentation or from those countries, please feel welcome to contact us. So now I will uh, turn over to what we are doing at Lund University on a local level on those questions. Uh, our university has recently decided to explore the opportunities of going for open access courses like MOOCs, massive open online courses, and also to improve teaching and <coughs> technology enhanced, le enhanced learning. To raise uh, quality, uh, personalization, employability for the learners, inclusiveness, increased learning, uh, to raise outreach, uh, social innovation, and better reputation for the students, and of course internationalization both for the students and for the academics and for, for the university as such. Now why are we doing that? Uh, as I said in the introduction, uh, we have uh, our university was uh, 
launched already in 1666, and um, we have been a hub for innovation and internationalization in, in the past, and almost uh, since that time. And we think that, um, oh, and we believe that we are a hub and will be a hub for innovation and internationalization at least to you some years ahead, and uh, we we have some years ahead for 20, 2030. So we think we have something to contribute with. And as I also said in uh, in my introduction, uh, we have a strong uh, cooperation with uh, very innovative uh, companies, and um, there's a strong research area. Um, which we cooperate with. So how we will do it and what we will do? We would like to explore the opportunities to give each one of us, each one of the learners, the possibilities to reach the potential each of us are aimed for. And that is really the task for the educational system. And that is about uh, individualization or personalization. And we will do explore the opportunities for enhanced quality. We will explore the opportunities, the strengths and weaknesses for making up open education and digital learning more affordable and strategic. We would like to explore strategic aims and possible target groups. We would like to explore the opportunities for a policy for Lund University work, working with open education. We would li like to explore the opportunities for global citizenship and to open education and digital learning and make open education and digital learning more affordable and more strategic for the learners. And how will we do it? To make a change, we think we can do it together. And we are together with um, with the LERO, which is the League of Uni European Universi Research Universities. <coughs> Some of those uh, LERO universities have already gone, gone open with MOOCs, for example. And we will learn from them. And we will also make, make it together with them. And we are also a member of Universitas 21. And they have also interest of making education more open and affordable for the learners. So again, we will do it together with the University of 21. And also, our university advisory board are supporting this movement. And recently, also the European University Association have written a statement and a policy paper on open education. And I learned last, just uh, last week that they will uh, make, have a task force for open education. So making a change, together we can. And our, um, the three important words for our university is to explain, improve, and change. And open education is very much about this. Of course, there are some challenges. But uh, will we make a change? Can we do it? Do we do it? Uh, there are four ch main challenges which we have so far identified. And those are the legal aspects, for example, uh, working with MOOCs or Another task than working with uh, stu annual students, you can't use the same kind of money. For example, so there is again financial issues as, as well. Working on 
with open education, there are a lot of educational issues you have to deal with. Some of them I have mentioned in this presentation. There are other issues and dimensions which are important working with open education. And then there are organizational challenges. Maybe we have to organize the university in a different way. We have to work more together. The infrastructure has to change. So in summary, what's in it for me with open education? Quality is an important issue. And quality for whom and or from by whom. But maybe most for for whom whom. Time is another important issue which I've talked quite a lot about, how we use the time. Time is quality. But you can also waste a lot of time doing wrong things at wrong places. What's in it for me for the learner? You gain a, a good reputation because you get uh, knowledge and the courses from all over the world with open education. Again, the critical thinking. Uh, recently, um, there have been studies uh, about um, that students for in open education and uh, distance education, they um, gain more critical thinking because they have to do other things than uh, campus students. And that is rather interesting research, which is not so very often mentioned in, uh, in those uh, discussions. I think we have to look more at that. Flexibility is another thing. With a good uh, reputation um, and with um, courses and studies from uh, the best universities in the world, students get uh, employment. And that is mainly what students are looking for, for. They would like to have a job and they would like to, have, to earn money. And they would also like to sometimes do something for society with their, with their work. They also would like to have internationalization, both in their education but also for the personal life. And with open education and with open education resources, you gain internationalization in a very automatic way because you just do it. So I have almost come to the end of my presentation. So thank you very much, uh, all of you out there. I don't really know which countries you are from, so I choose some languages. Uh, thank you very much, uh, every one of you who have taken part in this, this Global Educational Week, and uh, I really hope to see you during the week and all the inter interesting presentations uh, which I have seen from the program.